Uh, next up, yeah. Next up, we have Vitali, uh, Vitali Gordon, from CEO of Pharos AI. He was another uh, pinch hitter for the uh, the talk lineup. Uh, so I really appreciate him coming in. This talk should be really interesting. So automating developer operations is a topic that, I mean, hits all of us. So I'm excited to hear it. I'm not gonna take up any more of the time. Vitali, floor is yours. Hi folks, can you hear me? We need to do this whole uh, video conference dance. Um, see me, hear me, hopefully uh, everything's fine. Let me sc uh, share my screen. Um, kind of uh, uh, very quickly and see whether it works. So hopefully we tested this before. So automating, sorry, um, where is it? The screen, it disappeared. Oh, wow, sorry, my, uh, my entire thing uh, suddenly disappeared. Hopefully we can share it again. Okay, automating developer operations uh, with GraphQL. Uh, just a kind of quick background on me. I'm a CEO of a company called Ferris AI, but uh, prior to that, I was a co-founder of a project called uh, Salesforce Science, which is Salesforce machine learning platform. I was also running uh, machine learning engineering uh, at Salesforce and was working um, at LinkedIn as a senior data scientist. And I think one of the things that uh, I am not is uh, kind of you know a GraphQL or an API guru uh, like uh, some of the speakers uh, in this conference, but um, uh, I do um, have some uh, kind of interesting insights from uh, a user perspective of where did we find uh, that APIs and GraphQL in particular can solve kind of real uh, problems. So the story really begins when I was um, at Salesforce. I was running an engineering team of about. Um, uh, about 150 uh, uh, people and you know running an engineering organization of that scale uh, comes with a lot of uh, uh, with a lot of problems and uh, more specifically we found out that a lot of the problems were uh, especially around our developer uh, operations uh, area and this is what really kind of was the bottleneck for the entire uh, organization and I started to think, like, why really engineering is so much harder than what it appears to be in, you know, many other, like, you know, sales, marketing. Like, what is this nature of complexity? And one of the, at least the theories I developed, and it will be great if, like, the slides would move. Uh, one second. Sorry about that. So if you uh, if you look at these um, kind of acronym that you might know some of them ERP CRM um, HRM so on and so forth these are systems that people use to do their daily job like CRM is a customer relation management system that is the system that salespeople uh, use obviously Salesforce being one of the most uh, known uh, examples of the CRM system HRM is a human resource management system Workday can be one but there is uh, plenty of others. ATS is an applicant tracking system for recruiters. That's where they track. And, and the point we realize is actually like a lot of these professions kind of really converge on using this one system for to do pretty much all of their, uh, their entire work. And if you look at all of these systems, they also tend to have um, a very similar kind of uh, architecture that is also known as a free tier architecture where you have a data layer you have an application layer and you have um, a presentation layer. And really most of the interaction, uh, even as more and more systems come in, tend to actually use that system as a funnel. So at the bottom, you can imagine it's additional data sources that usually integrate into the data layer. And then you have additional kind of you know processes or kind of business processes or reports that usually kind of interact with the presentation layer and application layer. But then something had happened and really the systems stopped looking uh, this and you uh, we started seeing system, especially in the developer and developer operation space where we don't have one, this one giant centralized system for everything, but really we have a lot of fragmented uh, systems that actually uh, and a lot of them, you know, even if they have a presentation layer, really the interaction with them is mostly through a uh, certain of API layer. And kind of the presentation layer is just kind of, you know, a nice to have for administration and other things. And, you know, some of the system here you can see on the slide of it's, you know, Datadog or GitHub or AWS. And obviously AWS by itself is not just one service, it's hundreds of different services. And, and the problem that started emerging is when you start 
trying to solve a specific business use case, like these are what these uh, kind of uh, blue boxes represent, like employee of boring or cost optimization, you now start to integrate with multiple systems and really try to solve kind of um, an API problem by connecting to multiple systems, getting all the data, you know, sometimes storing it, sometimes not, and really figuring out like the authentication, pagination, and every one of these APIs is structured differently. Some of them use standards, some of them you know, like uh, open API, some of them, some of them don't. And really kind of the world beca became kind of this mess where and a lot um, a lot of the work really started to be to be around this like boilerplate, which is really about the connectivity to the API where the logic has actually became kind of a lower and lower percentage of the work that is actually uh, being done. And really what we do at Ferris, and you know, this is a kind of a, uh, apologies for the shameless plug, is uh, connecting all these uh, sources together into kind of one system so people can uh, can build uh, their application on top of it. But since this is a kind of GraphQL talk, uh, let me just quickly uh, jump uh, to a demo of uh, kind of how this thing uh, might look like. Um, so this is just kind of our website. You can go to it, you can look at it. But um, what I want to show is kind of the GraphQL Explorer. If you ever used GraphQL, you know there is an Explorer comes in. And uh, as you can see here, we kind of connect. Uh, in this account, I've connected uh, multiple uh, systems. But we're adding kind of more and more uh, with each day. But one of the really nice about um, um, kind of GraphQL that there is a schema with it and with tools with like GraphQL Explorer. This is just a vanilla GraphQL Explorer. We just integrated into our website for uh, kind of mostly authentication issues. Um, kind of so you don't have to worry about it. And we added this login logout button. But now, for the first time, you can actually kind of start seeing your data in a, in a way that most APIs don't provide you. And this is kind of really the magic and power of GraphQL. As you can see, AWS has you know additional services inside, and they have kind of here IAM, EC2, and all of that. And what we actually are doing is we're collecting kind of information in, in EC2. You can see a lot of other things. So, for example, I can click instances. And actually, like we are also collecting that data, um, unlike, for example, the Amazon APIs, which is also problematic, where it, it, the API forces you to actually um, execute every single query uh, with a specific account with a specific region uh, ID. Here, uh, as you can see, uh, if we just add, let's say, instance ID, instance type, um, you can just see that these two uh, instances uh, come from different regions. So we can actually collect and start enhancing an API for something that the actual real vanilla API does not provide that functionality because we're using kind of uh, this distributed system on, uh, on top of it. Uh, we're, by the way, using Fauna DB. Um, so uh, what also now uh, kind of happens, we can actually start joining different APIs. So Amazon uh, Web Services altogether, and this is just one example, has about 20,000 APIs. So just imagine like what is cognitive load requires to just know these APIs with all their parameters. And one of the nice things about GraphQL is you don't really need, like, for example, uh, for those of you who know a little bit about infrastructure, uh, EC2, which are instances, come will also attach with volumes uh, to store your data. And again, a volume will require you to call a completely different API, and you might not even know. But here we can look at the instance data, and you can see that, oh, you know, there are volumes here that are attached to this in these instances. Like, you don't have to create the join because the GraphQL uh, layer actually provides you and uh, provides you this. And then you can start also now not just actually exposing the data and joining, you can start decorating the data with additional information. Like one popular, uh, very popular use case with all of these cloud providers is, for example, pricing information. So now we can start uh, looking at you know pricing. And in this case, we can see that this is one, even though this is a T2 micro, this costs about seven cents per hour. And this the exact same instance actually costs only one cent per hour. And you can kind of you know start reasoning more about the type of infrastructure uh, that you use. And the price is actually, again, um, extremely um, uh, kind of extremely relevant because we are, in order to decorate, we are using all of uh, all of the information that is available because the pricing is based on the type of instance, the the things that they, it has installed in, on the, on the region where this instance operates, and you know many other parameters. But you just get it with the click. And the cool thing about it, what we're working with developer operations people that actually don't know GraphQL, that this is not uh, a tool that they use, but they really have 
no, there is no reason for them to learn the syntax because you can actually like just click your way into designing uh, the query. And another thing is just, you know, uh, you can look at all your certificates and so on and so forth um, and kind of odd, uh, other things. And uh, let's say there is a certificate, there is one important thing is expiration. Like for example, if you have a certificate that is about to expire, uh, you want to know that. But unfortunately, like for example, GraphQL is not great for, uh, for things uh, like, um, uh, adding additional logic around, let's say, you know, uh, comparing dates. So for this, we uh, we need to expand a little bit the syntax of GraphQL in, in order to do that. And we want to do it in a way that will be comfortable uh, to developers, but actually by using still um, kind of idiomatic graphical uh, concepts. So for those of you who, um, again, work with GraphQL, you folks know that there is the concept of resolvers where you can um, kind of add uh, additional code. So we kind of thought, how can I actually you kind of provide the functionality of graphical resolvers, but without actually having people implementing graphical resolvers, because this is not the level of, of, of functionality that I want to provide them kind of to kind of to to be able to modify my APIs. But I really want them to be able to kind of customize the API a little bit, but kind of make it in a safer in a safer way. So what we came up with, and this is kind of we have here also, um, uh, this is a public or a GitHub repository where we have kind of a bunch of useful uh, things that people are have done on our API and contributed. But let's look at this like ACM expiring certificate. And here there's just Python code um, that people can extend, which is basically just, uh, it's powered by AWS Lambda behind the scenes. And as you can see, this is a very similar query to the one I just wrote. But in this case, we actually want to know all the certificate that are you know, expiring in, you know, kind of this um, days left parameter days. So for example, um, kind of, uh, you know, I want to know whether I have a, any expiring certificate in 30 days and I want to do something about it if this is kind of true. So now we also have kind of a Lambda, which is basically another REST API, which can also be called for a GraphQL um, uh, interface. And uh, people can now add additional logic that GraphQL uh, does not support uh, out of the box. So for example, how one might call this API, like I said, because this is Lambda that is available, you can just use Postman or curl or call it, but actually we wanna uh, make it even uh, simpler uh, for people. Uh, so people can use our, uh, our CLI to call it, but you know something that would be even cooler is if they can use um, kind of this, uh, Slack. So let me just do uh, first login. I think it's uh, so uh, we try to associate for security purpose uh, purposes, kind of um, the Slack Slack user with the user of our platform. So not everyone who has access to the bot can execute everything on the infrastructure. And but here you can first list, um, and this is kind of a new feature, so it might not work perfectly. And as you can see here, uh, great job for engineers. You can see all of these uh, apps that I just showed you on the GitHub repo. And let's say if I want this ACM expiring certificate, I can actually um, do a slash command, which is Ferris app in invoke. And we also, the dash G is because it's a global app. And then we have a parameter here that says days left. Let's say 300, uh, because I uh, just to show you that it actually returns some results. And if I typed it correctly, we actually got you know two that expire in April of 2021. So obviously this is not something I need to do about now. But if let's say this was um, not Ferris app invoke. Uh, oh, sorry, I see thing here. The sheet, uh, days left equals 30, which is kind of a little bit more closer to my comfort level, you see that I just got a, 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 I got an empty response for which of these. And the, this is, again, um, how can you extend the functionality of GraphQL by, uh, by, co uh, by kind of adding Python code? So it kind of worked as a resolver, but without actually us uh, uh, giving access to users to our kind of own resolver, but actually adding their own resolvers on top of it and really enhancing the graphical schema with additional uh, uh, additional functionality. But 
obviously this is also uh, might not be enough because it's not just enough to do uh, to kind of have the data and this is where really the power of apis comes in because everything i showed so far are basically restful apis you can connect whatever you want so you might want to connect an orchestration uh, system like no domain and here you can see there's no domain and i won't kind of go uh, through this uh, too much but as you can see here you can start uh, invoking something from a trigger that might be time-based, might be event-based, might be you just call it from Slack, that executes some graphical query, then add some you know, uh, HTTP request. And then if it finds, uh, which is kind of our Lambda, and if it found uh, that there were results, uh, it, I want it to no both notify me on Slack, but also kind of open a Jira ticket and, and really kind of automating um, uh, the creation of Jira task, and then obviously the Jira ticket can fo uh, have a follow-on um, uh, resolution. And you know, this is kind of uh, every organization uh, can have whatever business process they want. And also, this is something that very nice that comes in with about I think two hundred other um, kind of actions that you might take. Uh, you might take, and this is how you start with really creating uh, more and more um, automation, which is you know, very easy, very visual. And really what we're trying to aim for is that 100% of really the, the logic would be um, the actual business problem that you are trying to solve as opposed to kind of working with kind of boilerplate uh, API integration and all the data munging uh, across it. Um, so I'll... Uh, Stop sharing, and I'll just leave more room for questions for anyone that might have them. Sorry, you took me by surprise for having a speaker actually end on time with room for speaker for questions. <laughs> uh, fantastic. I mean, this this is exactly the kind of stuff that this community needs ability to connect these different services together, building this. Uh, this data graph amongst all of your services is really quite impressive. Uh, do we have any questions in the audience? Let's, uh, let's go ahead and open that up here. Yeah, so while the audience uh, kind of uh, thinks about questions, I can share kind of w what are other things that um, you know people uh, people are doing. Uh, one uh, one thing that uh, I mentioned is like for example, employee of boring. So a lot of um, organization, I'm sure uh, each and every one of you work in at least one organization. That whenever an employee leaves the organization, you have this um, kind of long uh, spreadsheet of all the systems that you have to like remove that employee uh, from. Obviously, you know a lot of these things become better with kind of single sign-on solution, but even that usually does not solve uh, the problem kind of 100%. And that is like a classic thing that you want to. Uh, automate where you know the biggest offender for example is github where people usually bring their kind of personal accounts into the workspace like unlike email right which is kind of easier to control um, and some other thing is also kind of a, a very simple uh, things like um, uh, knowing who's um, uh, who's on call right now where this data usually sits on pager duty and really most developers and also devops people really don't like to go and start clicking on system and like work with their UI. So for example, like creating a you know a Slack bot that just you know pings pager duty and says, hey, who's on call right now for this service? But even better is uh, we have uh, some customers that implemented um, a, a complete end-to-end -end Slack uh, Slack automation where really they you know have Slack handles that every time there is a shift change on pager duty, the Slack handle changes of the the person that you know uh, the message needs to be route, routed to. Um, uh, additional kind of examples are people who are um, uh, working uh, the communication layer between, let's say, the developer organization and the infrastructure organization goes through a ticketing system. Like it's usually a larger organization where people used to ping each other through email and Slack, but then they said, oh, we, you know, for compliance purposes or some other, we need to have an audit log of all the changes that we make in production environments. And we need that audit log, um, let's say, you know, in Jira or something like that. And usually what happens is like a lot of time people by typing, they make mistakes and they really, what they need to type is very, um, Kind of, it's very robotic. It's not. It just they like they, the person on the other side just needs the correct information, the, the correct fields. It's not that there is like very you know, uh, and they're done thousands of these tickets. But every time people do them manually, 
and these tickets miss some missing information or you know it just takes too long so uh, so an automation might be if really what i need to do like is is a change that is a kind of let's say a result of me changing some code then why not actually me going to github or gitlab making that change there and having the jira ticket like open as uh, kind of automatically as a you know kind of event that is a is a result of, of that as opposed to me going and really implementing these two changes in two different languages and two different systems and sometimes the number is more than two that's um that's fantastic <laughs> i mean if you if, i'm sure a lot of our audience has had experience trying to connect these things together and the boilerplate just becomes so immense and so brittle and and uh being able to string together these optimal workflows is really the really the ideal and um that's great i'm gonna throw it up one last time for questions out of the audience otherwise i'd say we'll we'll go ahead and break uh for break early, but give this uh, one more minute here. Any, any specific questions? Even, even at the home audience, the uh, last speaker before break, everybody's wanting to rush to the coffee machine. Yeah. Well, yeah. so um, uh, yeah. everyone, uh, yeah, thank you. For your, for your, for my side, I want, I want a question for your platform. Yeah. Which is do you have uh, do you have like a developer account or what's the yeah you to... just don't need you you literally just go to ferris.ai click start button it's actually we just launched it a couple of weeks ago um and it's still you know uh, completely uh, completely free while we're kind of working with more uh, companies to figure out the use cases we just started and we have a community slack where you can ask questions and we have kind of a, a documentation that is never as extensive as it should be um it's like we're unfortunately our developers uh, much prefer developing new features uh, rather than uh, documenting them so that's uh, that's why we have the slack for as well but we're gonna improve on that as well and really kind of just um, check out uh, ferris.ai and would love for to hear uh, any kind of uh, comments people might have fantastic yeah and you're on twitter as well so they can find you and yes you at, and... at vitaly Gorin on twitter and you saw my email as well on the talk. Very good. Thanks so much for joining us. And